Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Ma Khalid. But today is the 22nd of May 2024, and these are the stories that we will be highlighting during the course of the show. We'll begin with uh, the Indian elections, all that has been happening till now. The fifth phase of the general elections in India has happened. There are only two phases left that are going to happen uh, on uh, the, f uh, of course, uh, at the end of May and in the beginning of June, and the results will be announced on the 4th of June. Now, uh, there are a lot of question marks as far as uh, these elections are concerned, whether it be the panic mode that the BJP is currently in because of the uh, low voter turnout that has happened in all of these uh, five phases, whether it, and of course their usage of the whole rhetoric against uh, the Muslims of the subcontinent against Pakistan, and uh, then trying to appease the Muslim community within India through certain uh, maneuverings uh, to win back the Muslim vote. Will that manage to, uh, you know, gain back uh, some of the Muslim votes, the 200 million plus Muslim votes that are voting or have voted or will be voting in uh, the elections in India? What has been the whole maneuvering of the BJP during these elections? Has it, this maneuvering gone in their favor or has it gone against them? We'll be talking about different eventualities of the Indian elections in our first segment. Then we are going to talk about the cross-border terrorism, ladies and gentlemen, that has been happening in uh, Pakistan, emanating from the Afghan soil. Pakistan has time and again highlighted the fact to the Afghan authorities in the interim Afghan uh, government that they need to stop these, uh, this involvement of the terrorist or if, uh, outfits that are emanating from the Afghan soil into Pakistani soil. But unfortunately, all uh, the recommendations, the requests made by the Pakistani side have fallen to deaf ears. Now, Pakistan, of course, has witnessed a surge in terrorist activities, whether it be Khabar Pakhtunkhwa or whether it be uh, Balochistan, because of the infiltration of the terrorists through the Afghan border. We'll be highlighting various aspects of that in our second segment. Then we are going to talk about uh, Gilgit Baltistan residents who've been uh, warned of a GLOF uh, this week. Now, what is GLOF? It is glacial lake outburst floods. This is an event that happens because of climate change, because of excessive warming and flash floods. And this is what the residents of Gilgit Baltistan have been told to be wary of. Finally, we'll be talking about the International Day for Biological Diversity that is being observed across the world today. The theme this uh, year is be part of the plan. This is a call to action for all the stakeholders to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity. Let's begin with our first segment and that concerns the Indian elections, what has happened so far, five phases of these elections have ended. There are two phases left, one on the 25th of May, another on the 1st of June. The results will be announced on the 4th of June. Uh, many different machinations have been seen emanating from the BJB side, and that has also been highlighted by the opposition, the combined opposition that calls itself India. Now, we've been joined by Dr. Amna Mehmood. She's a foreign affairs expert right here in the studios. Dr. Amna, thank you very much to have joined us. Dr. Amna. The fifth, five phases of these elections have ended. Only two phases are left. 970 million eligible voters ha are voting for, uh, the, for these elections. And uh, Monday's phase had 89.5 million voters eligible to vote for 49 seats in the lower house of parliament across six states and two union territories, a bit less than the previous stages as well. Can Indian states considered to be BJP strongholds spell trouble for Modi in these elections because of the different uh, rumors and theories that we have been hearing. Thank you, Umar. It has always been a pleasure to be with you in program. Uh, I think that uh, uh, trends are changing because uh, at the uh, start of election process, uh, Mr. Modi was very positive and he was claiming that he will uh, the contest will be one-sided mm -hmm. and, and he will uh, get, he 400, will get seats. 400 plus mm -hmm. seats. Mm -hmm. And now you see that his tone has been changed and his people's tone has be, uh, have been changed also. They are claiming that they never gave hatred speech, they never talk about uh, uh, things like that we are enemy of Muslims mm -hmm. and so. Mm -hmm. And then now they are appealing every faction of the society mm -hmm. and trying to assimilate them. 
I think that things are not so simple now. Hmm. And um, BJP, as it was uh, thinking that the states, especially which are not directly Hindi speaking states, they would be in favor of BJP as they have been in the Past. last two elections. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it is not the case. And as ju you just mentioned, 89 million voters hmm. for 40 seats. It's hmm. a big number, you know, hmm. of 89 million, huge voter hmm. strength. And voter strengths uh, not only represent the voters it's, uh, voter itself, mm. but the trend of the society and the people living there and the institutions there. And since the BJP was not addressing every faction of society, so voter trend would not be uh, as expected to mm. BJP. And you see that uh, uh, as uh, BJP claims that she is, it, it is responsible for the enormous economic growth in India, but it is visible that it was not directly responsible. It was the hangover of the policies of Congress government, mm. uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh, as he introduced uh, those policies because he was an economist. Mm. So in this time, they have not given any any agenda of economic development, social development, rural development, agriculture development. So that is claimed by the opposition parties, the alliance of opposition parties. Mm. India, they have given a lo long, long manifesto giving number of points for all these developments. And you know, common men, they want to have development. Mm. They mm. are more re more concerned about, and India is it claimed that it's going to be, uh, going to take the position of third largest economy, but they are uh, less than fifth economy right now. And uh, at the same time, uh, you know, statistics tell that there are 40% of Indian population is, is living below poverty line. It means that there is no equal distribution of mm. wealth and facilities among the Indians. And those Indians are also voters, mm. you know. That is true. And, you know, and, uh, and this is the time when they can they, they can assert their mm. presence that mm. we are the voters and we need all these because things. Because otherwise the BGP never cares of yeah. what, the Muslim pop what happens to the Muslim population. In fact, it appeases them to uh, or it kind of subjugates them to all kinds of tactics as we have seen in the last two uh, times as well. Now, you know, you talked of the, uh, of the Muslims. Let's uh, come to what has been told or pointed out by Narendra Modi during his different speeches, I'll just outlined some of these things. Hmm. There have been Muslims have been called infiltrators, people with many children. Ghus Bethye. Ghus Bethye, exactly. That was Amit uh, Shah. Intruders said, means ah, the exactly, intruders. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, but earlier this month, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in an interview, talks about the country's Muslims and denies that he had made any hate speeches yes. against the minority uh, in uh, different election rallies. He says he was shocked by the criticism of his speeches. Uh, and this has also, by the way, for the record, prompted a warning from the Election Commission of India to Narendra Modi. In your point of view, is the BJP now gone in a panic mode? And is this the reason why is it resorting to tactics such as denying uh, completely that it has been, uh, you know, uh, highlighting the Muslims of the subcontinent in a very negative way. I think the panic is visible. Panic is visible because Mr. Modi was very aggressive and especially when in, he inaugurated Ram Mandir mm. and he was very aggressive about the Muslims and he was also calling these all intruders and they should not live in India mm. if they would not adopt uh, Indian uh, identity. So I think that now he is claiming that it was not hate speech and what is hate speech? Mm. When you say and you have passed a law that all those not having documented here in India mm. and you know Indian uh, society is like a primitive society especially in rural areas people don't know they are not having their and it's a long research that uh, that is called uh, civil registration and civil registration is very low in India even Bangladesh even in Pakistan and uh, ASEAN countries as well because people don't know that what is the importance of being registered mm. so when they die when they born, born they are there are not recorded mm, most mm, of the times mm. and the Muslims living pr in a uh, prehistoric period from here you know 200 years back 300 years back they don't think that they need documentation mm. they adopted India by choice at the time of partition otherwise those uh, they could have moved to Pakistan exactly or Bangladesh mm. right now that is Bangladesh East Pakistan they could have moved mm. now they were th there they think that we are loyal to India 
so they, they the don't Indian need to be loyal to them so indian government have been uh, accepted their, their mm. uh, you know uh, presence and they were voters of the mm. uh, congress and bjp whatever mm. so i think that it is the right decision of indian uh, election commission to give respect to the voters mm. and you know i appreciate that uh, uh, the democracy in india is majorly attributed to uh, a strong position indian election commission has taken at least they try to conduct election in a fair way despite the despite mm. you know mm. all these pressures all the media is under the control of the government all the media all the people and societies under the control of or under the threat of mm. rss mm. you know uh, people uh, even then they have this this courage to say that be in your mm. guys you know now dr ramna there has been uh, there have been two main objectives as far as the bjp sloganeering during the elections are concerned a to s to prove somehow that the congress and other opposition parties are anti hindu hmm. and b in presenting muslims in the country as a permanent enemy of the hindus uh, of course you know there's so many examples that the congress is going to confiscate land property and cattle and jewelry of hindus and divide them amongst the muslims uh, the congress will run a bulldozer or on the recently const uh, constructed ram temple and allocate 15% of the country's budget for muslims i mean there is a series of uh, statements such as these uh, but has it had any impact positive or negative on the voters in these phases of the elections oh my there are number of points here you know uh, congress rule is not uh, uh, a matter of 20 years back or 30 mm -hmm. years back mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, mr modi has taken just two terms and before the 2014 there was congress rule for you know two terms and people know that what congress does and what congress did right and uh, it is not easy to make them fool mm. talking about 15% of the budget 20 muslims are more than 20% of the population if 15% of national budget is attributed to them that is their right mm. no government is giving them favor and in return they give vote to every government every government they are scattered they are not having few and there is no uh, separate electorate in india so every constituency is having some number of muslim voters especially the up and cp these are the traditional areas of muslim minority but the, that minority is more than 26% you know if you remember mm. the period of congress ministries 26% if 26% population is there they have right to uh, receive 15 percent of the budget mm. and they are not claiming it there that is the duty of the government secondly uh, congress has never been favorable uh, for pakistan i in the last program we discussed that norwegian pragmatism was for the whole world mm. but not for the pakistan it was the congress who fought three full-fledged large-scale wars with pakistan mm. not the bjp so you see that their uh, behavior was uh, towards pakistan was so hostile mm. and now uh, mr modi in his last speech was claiming that uh, one of the pakistani politicians gave uh, his own opinion mm. that uh, if congress would come that would be mild on pakistan that was just in comparative sense that they would be mild as compared to mm. bjp mm. Uh, so it was taken up and he said they are asking for the prince to come because prince was favorable mm. to them and we can quote and muslim of india and even the hindus knows that uh, uh, congress has never been mild or favorable or friendly towards pakistan even the last war uh, uh, we fought uh, in 1971 it was congress that was responsible for the disintegration of pakistan True. and they continued that policy later on as mm. well so i don't think that uh, voters are so goof mm. and so simple and even the muslim voters cannot forget the, the one week or two week back uh, speeches of mr modi mm. and the treatment of rss and the treatment of uh, um, uh, police with the school uh, girls and college girls how they hostage make them hostage on the road snatch their um, you know wheels and mm. uh, uh, head scarves the uh, people cannot forget even the uh, people uh, from uh, moderate hindus they were furious on that because they are the national of india of and uh, no government has right to do with them i don't think mr modi can right now at the nick of time instead of uh, making apology to the mm. whole nation mm. otherwise uh, he is not getting any benefit all right that. now no, look at uh, the discriminatory behavior the hate towards the muslims and other uh, uh, you know minorities in india then 
unemployment, there's inflation, there's lack of security, hmm. government's attempts to muscle dissent that we have seen with the opposition, hmm. putting them in jail or you know suspending their accounts just before the election so that they cannot uh, uh, take part properly in the elections. Uh, the election analysts say that this is an indication of lack of enthusiasm amongst the public about Modi. I'm talking about the reaction that has come hmm. in the way of the less voter turnout. Uh, voter turnout, Haan. yes. And they say that the less voter turnout is because of the lack of enthusiasm of people on Modi and that is why they do not even want to go and vote because they know if Narendra Modi comes back into power what his strategy is going to be. How true is this analogy in your point of view? Um, over, I think that they indicate two things. One is that people are uh, uh, people have lost their trust in Mr. Modi's government, mm -hmm. and they think that if the, he could not make a change in Indian society, they, he is not able to provide some good for the Indian society mm -hmm. and the common people. And uh, as you just mentioned, in economic and political and social development, mm -hmm. then uh, there is no need to give vote for him. Second, at second level, you see that they feel themselves so helpless that their vote will not be counted and there would be uh, no respect for their vote that that can change the government or mm. the plight of Indian uh, people. Th this, these are the two levels. They are feeling helpless. And that's why the, the uh, ex exact turnover would be, you know, that would be visible on mm. uh, on their website after seven rounds completed. Mm. But uh, it is claimed that now uh, at least 30 percent uh, less votes have been mm. cast. It means that uh, the voter which Mr. Modi was expecting, the uh, RSS extremist voter in India, that is least interested in turning out for the vote. Because Otherwise, it, is, it is a strategy that the Modi government has employed that it has dissuaded that voter in fact. I think that that would be counterproductive. Mm. As you see that Congress rallies, initially they were not rich and large, but after some time, first and second uh, round, these rallies were were quite big. Same in the in the case in Kashmir, mm. in Tamil Nadu, in uh, Punjab, in uh, adjacent areas to Pakistan. These rallies were quite big, and there was a lot of attendance. And uh, uh, one thing that in the beginning, uh, Congress uh, opposition and Congress were having this strategy uh, that uh, they were contesting each other as mm, well mm. and BJP. But later, they realized that this is this is counterproductive. Mm, mm. So they made some adjustment on different seats that they would not contest seat against each other, and they would All contest right. only BJP. I think that technique, uh, that uh, that strategy, would also pay to the opposition. All and right. uh, if Mr. Modi would be having less than 400 seats, then it would be a hung parliament and Mr. Modi will not be all powerful to bring all constitutional amendment he wants to bring. All right. Last question, I want a very short answer. Yeah. Has the media impact, the, most of the media is under uh, the thumb of uh, BJP and Narendra uh, Modi. Has the media had any impact on the voter turnout, on the voter mindset? A. B. How do you see the combined opposition India as well in these elections? Do you feel they are going to have an impact now? that the voters see that they have another option? Media has lot of impact. Media has created a hype in favor of BJP because they have spent lot of money on them. Hmm. But I think that ground realities, since they are different and as depicted on media, uh, so people would be having their own opinion and other than media there is a social media as of well course. and the power of social media you cannot deny paramount. because uh, yeah now it's paramount and secondly you ask about congress i think that if india uh, not congress uh, the combined opposition uh, uh, combined opposition india mm -hmm. but main political party is congress mm -hmm, since course. congress has adopted the strategy to respect all the parties in india in the the alliance they have mm -hmm. made I think that would make a difference. If they would not get majority, at least they will make a, a strong uh, um, uh, presence. presence in mm. strong presence in their right. Lok Sabha. All right. So let's see what happens. We have just a couple of days left before the results will be announced on the fourth of June. We are already uh, today, the twenty second. Yeah, so just yeah. around two weeks left before we know who is coming into power, whether it's going to be a good parliament. for India, good for uh, the region. Let's see. I hope it will be good for India uh, and good for the region. Yeah, thank we, you very we wish that. We also wish. That definitely. Dr. Amna Mahmood, foreign affairs expert, thank you very much to have joined us. Let's come to our second story, and that concerns uh, the cross border terrorism and the recent surge that has been happening, in fact, since quite some time. Uh, whether it, uh, I mean, when it concerns Pakistan, and this is 
through cross border infiltration of terrorist outfits through uh, from afghanistan into pakistan uh, and of course uh, there have been different incidents whether it be in khyber pakhtunkhwa whether it be in balochistan uh, this surge uh, of course has uh, you know resulted in many uh, martyrdoms but this has also resulted in our armed forces taking on these militant outfits head on and many important uh, militant leaders and their compatriots have been killed in uh, these very incidents pakistan has time and again told afghanistan uh, that it needs to stop the infiltration of uh, such terrorist outfits from its boundaries uh, from its uh, uh, you know soil into pakistan but to date there hasn't been any concrete action or reaction taken from the afghan side uh, to discuss different uh, elements of this uh, increase in insurgency through the afghan border into pakistan we've been joined by brigadier retired masood ahmed khan is a defense analyst right here in the studios thank you very much brigadier sahab to have joined us brigadier sahab this surge in terrorist incidents uh, originating from afghan soil time and again we have had um, our uh, military leaders talk about it we've had our political leaders talk about it we've had delegations go, go, going to afghanistan to uh, you know uh, highlight this to the afghan authorities but nothing has happened why is the afghan government not fulfilling its obligations it's very simple <laughs> is it is been long time uh, since uh, they took over kabul in 2021 and basically no we have discussed in detail in the last many shows mm. but uh, one thing is very important that no they are using of uh, these uh, ttp elements as a proxy against pakistan that is one to preserve some power over pakistan for negotiation as a bargaining chip in future that is one factor and secondly they don't want to alienate at the same time the mm. ttp because of uh, fear of, of this uh, that joining mm. islamic state mm. and third is uh, they have been they have their allegiance to the afghan uh, taliban mm. so they have been fighting alongside uh, afghan taliban Uh, against ISF, NATO, and United States, mm. so that is one also factor. And fourth, three probably it is the basically the Pashtun ancestry and uh, also the tribal affiliation. These are the some factors. That's why they are not uh, taking any uh, import any action against these uh, TTP elements inside Afghanistan. Mm. Now, Brigadier Masood, you know, uh, I see the resolve of our armed forces. that is at as steadfast as, as it has been in the last decades in the last years as well even now as we say in uh, some baza in job a yeah. district of balochistan there are combing operations that are going on 29 terrorists have uh, you know been killed in in operations in intelligence based operations you know uh, but we have also lost uh, uh, our jawans uh, like major babar khan who embraced jah- shahadat on the 14th of this very month while fighting gallantly you know the 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 fact is that our armed forces remain steadfast in the resolve to defend our motherland how important a message is this for uh, the interim afghan government uh first of all i would like to highlight the importance of this sambaza and mm. zop uh, area basically uh, sambaza is located about 58 kilometers from zop city mm. and t- on the road towards uh, south waziristan to the north of this sambaza you uh, we have uh, south waziristan and di khan mm. and to the west it is the zabul and paktika provinces of afghanistan right. so historically this has been sambaza the route has been f- used for drug trafficking weapon trafficking and also infiltration to carry out uh, uh, terrorist activities inside uh, balochistan so this was specific and that is the uh, imp- uh, importance of this and the previous attack which was carried out in uh, zob cantonment and uh, kila sefulla hmm. this is this route was basically used and subsequently the pakistan army focused and carried out interest based operation as you highlighted 29 they were killed and major babar was also martyred uh, recently hmm. now there as far as resolve is concerned the resolve of the military leadership especially chief of army staff has made it very clear 
the un, they will go uh, basically the, nef the they will thwart all the nefarious designs of terrorists and they will go for the elimination of uh, uh, these terrorists across pakistan the uh, resolve of political leadership military leadership they are on the same page as far as the terrorism is concerned and you as highlighted the the gallant soldiers they are sacrificing their mm -hmm. lives across pakistan while battling with these uh, terrorists so resolve they are determined to eliminate uh, the terrorism at all costs from the country. Hmm. Mid, uh, you talked, sir, about uh, the bargaining chip that yeah. the TTP is being used as by the Afghan interim government. A bargaining chip for what? Again, I mean, hasn't Pakistan always been there for the Afghans, for the successive Afghan governments over the decades? Isn't it housing the largest number of Afghan refugees since decades and even continues to do so as we speak? That is unfortunate, ungrateful. Hmm. And you highlighted right from 1947, if mm -hmm. we see the Afghans, they basically oppose Pakistan. They oppose Pakistan admission to United Nations. And subsequently, when uh, President Daoud, he took over as a prime minister under King Zahir, he was instrumental in instigating the Pashtuns and subsequently he tossed this uh, term Laro Bar of uh, re uh, reunification of these Pashtun either side and then subsequently the slogan of Pashtunistan and the so-called concept of Duran line and etc. Mm. So and subsequently we also saw the Bajor operation in 1960s they uh, invaded Bajor and 1961 again but credit and ha heads off to the Bajori Pashtuns then and the Bajor scores uh, scouts then the, the, their uh, designs they were basically they were throttled by mm -hmm. them but un that is very unfortunate as you highlighted we hosted 5.5 million afghan refugees when it was a peak time and today still there are about 3 million afghan refugees including registered and undocumented they are in li still living in pakistan so pakistan has facilitated all the things afghan transit go trade goes through pakistan uh, and, and we have been facilitating them all this, uh, whether, whether it is medical facilities or any other thing. Uh, and despite all the, our generosity, uh, and uh, we haven't seen any uh, positive response or positive indication from any government right from mm -hmm. 1947, leaving aside the period of 96 and 2001, then those Taliban rest uh, every time uh, they have been opposing Pakistan. That is very unfortunate part of it, I'm realizing. Another important thing I would like to highlight, that is they, when we talk of Pashtuns, we have more Pashtuns. We have 35 million Pashtuns in Pakistan. Those basically settle in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Karachi. There are Pashtuns, those are settled in rest in the Punjab, in Sindh, and in Azad Jammu in Kashmir, there are mm. Pashtuns. Uh, in Afghanistan, the total population, they constitute uh, about 42% of total population, there are 18 million. So we have more Pashtuns, so they can come and join us. Mm. That is very, but unfortunately, they have been using this uh, so-called uh, uh, slogan of Pashtunistan for their uh, basic, uh, just to propagate the, uh, this term Pashtunistan. Mm. If they were sincere, they, uh, they have been opposing this uh, merger of uh, FATA, erstwhile FATA with the uh, man Khyber Pakhtun Khan. So, so basically it is political, uh, basically these are gimmicks to uh, get popular mm. support from the Pashtuns. You talk of political gimmicks, is there also an internal political gimmickry that is going on that you have also alluded to in the beginning of our conversation of uh, uh, the you know TTA being afraid of the TTP aligning with uh, other uh, uh, you know uh, other outfits that are also present in Afghanistan exactly. and that are also being harbored by the Afghan interim government. If I would like to understand if they are so afraid of the TTP aligning with other uh, nefarious outfits, why not get rid of an all and every nefarious outfit? Why are you continuing to harbor such outfits in Afghanistan? So probably that one reason is uh, they uh, have not able to get the full control of entire Afghanistan and the recent development we have seen the resistance 
starting from northern uh, provinces of mm. uh, Afghanistan. So the Nara resistance front has uh, basically not they are active again. And there are other parts, even Nangahar recently we saw there was a uh, resistance from the Pashtun side. Mm. And so some of the individuals that were killed. So these are the basically factors uh, and basically now it's up to the international community as well as uh, the United States and the regional countries, they have to take a proper or a serious decision uh, to take the situation seriously. Mm. And we will looking forward to for this Doha conference, which is scheduled next month in uh, uh, under United Nations is being held in Do uh, Doha. Mm. So Afghanistan has decided to attend that conference. Amir uh, Muttaki is uh, attending that conference okay. and sub likely the, the same Amir Muttaki who said in his first statement yeah. when he came into power that the Afghan soil will not be used ag against any other neighboring country quote unquote exactly. and look what is happening. They, we provided them an uh, irrefutable evidence of presence of uh, TTP elements, whether it's time and again, time and again, mm. all with exact location. Mm. So same is confirmed by the CENTCOM chief. The same is confirmed by the United Nations Analytics Sport and Sanction Monitoring Team. The same was confirmed by the security think tanks of uh, uh, United Kingdom mm. and also by Tom West and in, in, the, uh, in the several uh, uh, press conferences, they mm. confirmed the presence of and this it was precisely said that TTP is a threat to Pakistan's stability. Mm. And more, uh, as you highlighted, the presence of Islamic State, they demonstrated their capability. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, they have gaining the strength. Basically, 9-11, United States uh, uh, basically invaded Afghanistan. On the basis of, yes. On the basis mm. of, Al it was target was Al-Qaeda. Mm. So now the Al-Qaeda has regrouped, they have regained. So the, now they have become a real threat to the world peace now. Hmm. And also the US and other Western elements. Now, uh, you know, uh, the DGISPR uh, made a very interesting and important media briefing earlier uh, this month. He talked about many things, some of things, those we have already discussed. But he also uh, talked about the 12 protests that the Foreign Office has uh, made to the Afghan side and our army chief who has taken a clear stance that Pakistan has serious reservations on the hideouts of banned outfits in Afghanistan. What now should be, in your point of view, Pakistan's modus operandi to eradicate all such terror outfits? So Pakistan has already demonstrated its capability. Yes. We basically waited for two years. Hmm. We exercised restraint by not undertaking any kinetic action inside Afghanistan. So that was a desperate situation. There was a surge of terrorist activities using Afghan soil and attacking right from Chatral down to Gawadar. Hmm. So th it was decided by the military leadership to strike inside Afghanistan. So that was a demonstration when we carried out attacks, in, uh, the strikes inside in coast, hmm. coast and uh, Paktia. Hmm. And so recently then we also basically the cross border infiltration with number of uh, terrorists they were killed. And more recently, at Khalachi, the, there was a standoff and there was a cross, uh, there was a f firing between the two forces. Hmm. So, the several uh, terrorists and the Afghan uh, security officials, they were killed in those attacks. Hmm. So, message is, uh, which has been conveyed, hmm. uh, that is very clear. There will be no compromise as far as the, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Pakistan is concerned. Hmm. So, we may go for more strikes in future, hmm. but at the same time, the diplomatic uh, uh, talks that cannot be ignored. We will still go for it to engage the Afghan Taliban, hmm. either directly or through the regional countries or through international forums. All right. You know, uh, when you look at the number of deaths in 2023, uh, the number of injured, the areas, I mean, the Khyber Pakhtun Khan and Balochistan, of course, being the main uh, regions that uh, have been uh, targeted. And the DGIS pair also highlighted many of those, how many have been martyred, how many have been injured, how many operations have uh, happened against those. Why, cre I, mean, I mean, fail to understand as a Pakistani, uh, why create such an environment in Pakistan and what does Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan tend to gain from it? I understand it wants to, to have some kind of bargaining chip that we've just under, you know, discussed. But in the long run, a stable Pakistan means a stable Afghanistan, isn't it? 
that is exactly that's what the, our foreign policy is peace and stability is directly linked with peace and stability inside pakistan mm. so therefore we want a peace and stable afghanistan mm. but provided that uh, uh, they, if they basically crack down on the terrorist uh, hideouts inside Afghanistan, not threatening Pakistan as we discussed, mm. there are other uh, terrorist outfits threatening the regional countries as well. Mm. So basically, no, it is up to the international community to basically to address this serious issue. But you know, they, uh, this is what is very important. The world community knows what is happening in Afghanistan, but why isn't it acting? Where are the important powers that be? Where is the US that was there for two decades? Probably now, probably we, uh, I, I'm hopeful, but maybe we, we can, can get some result from this uh, Doha coming up, uh, mm. Doha agree, uh, conference. But uh, they have realized, uh, Russians, they have realized with the recent strikes, the Chinese, they, are, they have realized because mm. the Eastern Turkestan Islamic ETIM, government yes. basically of their involvement in, in 2021, the attack, they were basically, uh, they were part of with the TTP. Mm. And still, and you never know the recent attack in Basham attack, uh, there you can be a connection mm. of uh, mm. Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement. Mm. So that's why Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement cannot go across China into Xinjiang province to carry out attacks. So therefore, they are facilitating aligning with TTP and to attack Chinese interests inside Pakistan, mm. whether it is CPEC, are the basically are the um, areas in the south of Balochistan mm. if they are facilitating the Baloch terrorists at the same time? All right, such an unfortunate thing, uh, uh, Brigadier Sahib, because the fact is that when we see the past of uh, Pakistan's uh, you know uh, sincerity vis a vis Afghanistan, it's so sad when we see how it's not just now, it's not just in the, the Afghan government. Here we see more and more violence happening. But even in the previous Afghan governments, I haven't seen one single Afghan government that has been sincere uh, to Pakistan, despite all that Pakistan has done for it. If it continues, which is, I'd like a very short answer to this, is my last question. Brigadier Sahib, if uh, Afghanistan, this interim Afghan government continues with its strategy, even post the Doha uh, talks, uh, sh uh, apart from uh, uh, Pakistan's aggressive posture towards all such elements, how should Pakistan deal with the Afghan interim government? Then we can go for some uh, uh, mayors uh, while uh, ref, uh, we talk of this Afghan transit trade. Then we can and uh, we can we can ask for the, some processing fee for the uh, uh, goods they are being mm. tra tra basically transported to Afghanistan. And secondly, we can ask for the bank guarantees of uh, those items which are being uh, transported to Afghanistan. Mostly, they are basically smuggled back to Pakistan. So, such like steps and some uh, at the same time some uh, sanctions from internationally uh, uh, basically banning the uh, visit the movement of Afghan Taliban uh, leaders and some sanctions may force them mm. and mostly the regional approach probably it will they can prevail the Chinese they can prevail an important role True. the Russians and the mm. Central Asian Republics Iran Turkey Pakistan they can r play a positive role okay so all eyes are oh, yeah. basically right now on the Doha talk yeah, so yeah. let's see what happens as a result of that thank you very much Brigadier Masood Ahmed Khan sub defense analyst to have joined us to have come in the studios it's always a pleasure to have a very uh, fact and figure based uh, you know uh, talk with you as far as uh, Pakistan's defense apparatus is concerned. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much, you. sir, to have joined us. Let's come to our last two stories. The first concerns uh, Gilgit Baltistan, whose residents have been warned of GLOF this week. What is GLOF? It's the glacial lake outburst floods. Uh, events and flash floods that could happen as a result of uh, climate change. The Met Department, the Pakistan Met Department has stated that daytime temperatures in Khabar Pakhtun Khan and Baltistan expected to remain 4 to degrees Celsius higher than normal between the 21st and 27th. We also know that we need to be careful for Punjab and Sindh as well the atmospheric condition is likely to trigger such a glow event of flash floods in uh, Gilgit Baltistan and Chitral districts of a Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa. We all remember how in 2022 flash floods and gloves hit many villages in Hunza, Nagar, Ghiza, Rasto, Skardu and Gilgi districts of Gilgit Baltistan. So uh, I hope all the people will continue to remain vigilant. 
Finally, today is the International Day of Biological Diversity, uh, and that is 22nd of May. Now, bi what is biological diversity? It is often understood in terms of the wide variety of plants, animals, and microorganisms, but it also includes genetic differences within each species, for example, between varieties of crops and breeds of livestock, and the variety of ecosystems that exist. Uh, the global community is called to re-examine the relationship, our relationship to the natural world. One thing is extremely important that despite our technological advances, we are completely dependent on healthy and vibrant ecosystems for our water, food, medicine, clothes, fuel, shelter and energy, just to name a few. This year, the theme of the International Day for Biological Diversity is be part of the plan. This is a call for action to encourage governments, people, local communities, NGOs, lawmakers, businesses to highlight ways in which they are supporting the implementation of this biodiversity plan. We need to be conscious, we need to be cognizant of working together as one for our Mother Earth and for all uh, those who pa form part of our ecosystem. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's news. We'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new story segments that pertain to us, you and Pakistan. Stay safe, Allah. Hafiz. <laughs>